Okay. So should we, yeah, we should wait till about 9.30 to start, I think, right? That's the ideal thing to do. And would the Zoom be open, Monica? Or... Okay. So I'm going to, I'm having a slightly different introduction to you, Yuan. I'm not reading any, yeah. uh, anything about you that is uh, already not known to people, or I'm sure people can, internet can tell all that. So I'm going to, I had the opportunity to learn a lot from your Instagram. So uh, it's been interesting and uh, I also had the opportunity, I'd seen uh, Susan Simard's uh, video about two, three years back or something like that. But then I shared, had the opportunity to share it with Venkat this morning. So we had a start to the day was with the video, <laughs> the TED talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was, um, it was re uh, rekindling what I, what I registered then. But every time you listen to something, it gives you a new perspective, right? So so good. So I'm looking forward. So let's wait for, I think there are, I mean, we'll wait for others to join in. So we've set links where people uh, will join in through Zoom and others will okay. join directly in uh, okay. with you. So good. Hi, Priya. How are you doing? Hi, Sri Priya. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you. Good. Hi, Yuvan. Hello. You know, I should say uh, Shri Priya is a guru for me, uh, for developing my core, uh, brought in a kind of discipline in me to raise, raise close to the sunrise, practice yoga. I, I, to... I think it requires more than teaching. It's the self-discipline that people take after they learn something. Hello, Mr. Krishan. Uh, how are you doing, sir? Hello, everyone. Yes. So it's good, good to be... Um, Seeing you once again this week, I think uh, we just met sometime back on our other session and now good to be seeing you. But I know sustainability is very close to you because you also had some certification on it and things like that. You did do some extra studies in it, right, Mr. Kishan? That's right, yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Very nice. So we'll just give it a few more minutes for others to join. And now good to be seeing you, but I know sustainability... Looking forward to a very new perspective on leadership. Sorry, uh, sir? Looking forward to a very uh, new perspective on leadership. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know. I'm also going to discover with this through this conversation with Yuan because he has a, I think it's like getting these different, um, completely different perspectives. So we've been boiling and uh, enjoying what we already know, but uh, there is a lot more that is hidden in plain sight. And I'm looking forward to hearing that from you and myself, and then ensuring that it's a responsibility that we connect the dots when we coach leaders and when we work with uh, the leadership community. Sure, sure. Yeah. Hello, sir. You are muted, sir. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, all. Yes. Good evening, Sudhwanam. Yes. Evening. Good evening, Marin. Good evening, Vaishali. So, I think, I think it's about two more minutes to 9.30, I think, or 7 p.m. in India, and I'm in Singapore. So, um, let's just wait for, just give it a couple of more minutes. But thanks to everybody who've been ahead of time. Hello, Bhuvana. You're mute. You're on mute, Bhuvana. Hi, hi. Sorry. Yes, good. So we are actually on live as well. So we are live on YouTube. Um, and uh, whoever is joining through the Zoom link will be here and the rest will be in YouTube live. Hi, Yuvan. Hello. Hi. 
Hi, hi, Kumar. Hi Priya. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi Priya Ram. Hi Kumar. Hi Bona. Hi Prasad. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yes, always. Yeah. <laughs> so it's about 9.29 and I'm going to just give that extra one minute for everybody to join and then we should go. Then we should start off. Sure. Good luck. Thank you. Hi, Vaishali. Hi, Priya. How are you? I'm good. Priya Ram, how are you? I'm good, sir. Hi. Kumar, your friends are joining. Uh, we had shared the links with them, right? Yeah, yeah, four of, four of them should be joining any time. Right. What about uh, um, Anna, uh, late into you? Yeah, yeah. She, 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 we have sent the invite, huh? she'll be joining. Let me just send a reminder. Okay. okay, okay. Good. So, it's 7 p.m. in India and 9.30 p.m. here in Singapore. And I'm looking forward to this conversation today. And I want to welcome each one of you to this talk on, I would say rather a conversation, not a talk on the ecology of leadership. So I'm Shri Priya Venkatraman and I'm looking forward to speaking with Yuan Avis. I mean, Yuan has multiple facets to his personality and I'm going to refrain from any formal introduction. Some of you may be well aware of who he is and some, I'm, I'm sure the internet can give you more about uh, him than me. So just as we say, definitions are found in dictionaries and meaning is found in people. I'm going to introduce Yuan through what brings meaning to his purpose and also to our topic in some ways. And what I'm going to do is to say some powerful quotes that you, I would request our viewers to reflect on and that will help you understand what Yuan is and what he is doing and what he's gonna be speaking to us about. The first quote is, when you see this paper, do you see the clouds? It's by Tich Nath Han. And I want to repeat, when you see this paper, do you see the clouds? So that's one facet to Yuan. Another facet is, if democracy is a matter of shared beliefs, then I believe in the democracy of species by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Another facet to Yuan would be, activism is my rent to living on this planet. Activism is my rent to living on this planet by Alice Walker. And when you reflect on this quote, that will give you a facet to you, Anne. And another facet would be, perhaps the time has come to cease calling it the environmentalist view, as though it were a lobbying, outside, out, lobbying effort outside the mainstream of human activity and start calling it the real world view. So this is by E.O. Wilson. And this would also bring another facet of Yuan. And one more, I should say, which is, uh, which is where the, uh, the journeys never stop. Traveler, there are no paths. Paths are made by walking. This is an aboriginally, aboriginal saying. And that is also another facet of who Yuan is. Am I doing some justice to all this, Yuan? I believe these would be very close to uh, who you are. 
Yeah. So good. So that is what Yuan is all about. These different quotes can give you an idea of what he's trying to do. And what we are doing in this conversation between him and me and with all of you is to say ecosystems actually thrive through innovation. And as a director of Global Coaching Lab in the form of innovation being my main job, I believe it would be useful for us to connect the dots from the perspectives that Yuan lends to the insights of leadership. And through this conversation, I believe we will get some facets of leadership that are hidden in plain sight. So Yuan, I'm take, uh, I mean, I would request you to start off from here. So we are looking for some hidden facets that we are not aware of. And I would leave the stage to you for some time before we have more questions coming. Um. Thank you, Shripri. I think that's a lovely way to set the context. And um, this is new terrain for me. My work as a writer, activist, teacher lies in uh, reimagining our relationship with the earth and, uh, and speaking about it. And what that might mean within the scope of workspaces, business, and so on is, um, is fresh soil for me. And it's interesting it was interesting and it will be for me to explore into what all that might connotate. So I, um, I put together a few ideas which I wanted to spark off at the beginning. Yeah. Or perhaps not all of them, maybe one or two. Sure. And then uh, you could intervene and uh, take this in which direction you feel uh, it could go. So let me, I'm going to just share my screen. One second. So. Can you see my screen? Yes. So I want to build a little pretext, a little foundation for this into what we might conventionally think a good life is, you know, cars, houses, money, um, material wealth, making profit. And who tells us this? How did we decide this is what a good life means? Sure. So we see it on ads. Okay, celebrities tell us so. Uh, is it the truth? Is it a social construct? Is it something we believe in? Does it have a basis? Let's look at some of the underpinnings of these. For instance, if we look at the way our urban lives are. We can be called consumer beings. We consume things. We don't know how to grow our own food. We can't make our houses. We don't know how to stitch our clothes. We can consume. We do jobs sitting on a seat. Uh, we get some money for that and we can consume. True. So, and that, that kind of builds a separate branch of a species itself. And one more thing within our um, mainstream of society within our culture, urban culture, I should say, is the sense of separate self. I think the rest of all this material will, political power, everything, structural violence. Structural violence means that when I see something on the shelf in a supermarket, do I see beyond that something you were saying? You quoted Thich Nhat Hanh. You know, I see a shampoo bottle that might have palm oil and which contributed to the killing of orangutans in Indonesia, say, for its sodium lauryl sulfate. Do I see all that on the shelf or do I see only the bottle? Or do I see only that packet, whatever that is? Structural violence is hidden in this whole thing. And my sense of self, separate sense of self is something which is emphasized by all these factors. I am separate. I have to have this. This is my sense of self-worth. And my sense of self is divorced from earth, from community, from the larger elements. So uh, through this conversation, what I also wish to explore, and as a person, I'm, I explore alternatives. I explore counter currents to the convention, to the mainstream. And I just want to put in a few ideas here. So what could be 
alternatives um alternatives from an ecological lens meaning that it makes ecological sense because i cannot i'm not apart from ecology there's no human in nature even in a very physical sense when i take three breaths two breaths is from the phytoplankton in the ocean one breath is from the trees so and also drawing wisdom from ecology so okay this is a picture i often use and and it shows something very interesting it it's an extraordinary diversity under a single leaf so these are aphids now this is an ant now ants raise aphid livestock like we raise you know cattle and and goats and so on ants have been raising aphid livestock for millions of years long before us and then the ladybirds are eating the aphids on this side and protects the aphid aphid releases sugar solution for the ant to drink all of them have a house within this plant the beetle is helping the plant you see you see the diversity of creatures as well as relationships and interactions here there's friendship there's competition there's predation there is extraction there is reciprocity something uh which this calls out for perhaps which we can think of in our space as learning space as work space and so on so there are flows of extraction there are flows of counter extraction the flows of friendship all kinds of energy flows somehow our material growth our, our paradigm of development is purely about extractivism and in nature there is only one example where you see purely extractivism that is to uh, devour the host and be affected in the process which is exactly what is happening to us in terms of climate crisis biodiversity loss the pandemic which is anthropogenic there's only one example which is the emperor of all maladies cancer as the one example in nature where the relationship is pu- purely extractivist and the host dies as well as the species on the host dies so i just want to add this quote to to the quotes you introduced colin baker he was a linguist who explored the complexity and uh, interrelationship between language and landscape um he said in the language of ecology the strongest ecosystems are those that are most diverse and and my question is this in our workspaces in our uh, schools education systems do we allow for diversity or do we do monoculture do we homogenize you know um a very deep principle in nature and its resilience its stability is the fact that all kinds of beings exist and all kinds of relationships exist and this diversity this complexity between things and the virtue of their interactions what holds the ecosystem gives it that uh the stability and and robustness is this there sufficiently you know uh in this in the spaces we inhabit is something radical nature is saying and it's ancient it says that somebody who perceives somebody who speaks voices something diametrically different from what i am is also necessary for the community for its stability do we allow space for that or do we suppress dissent or somebody is uh, has a idea which is different from me or oh, no the move out of the way sure. so those are some thoughts on diversity and um, would you like to uh, maybe channel this in a different way or i could share a few more ideas yeah i think we should uh, we should we should channel it with some uh, with some questions from our side and then okay. we will continue yuan okay one of the things that i'm getting from whatever you're sharing is there is a large uh, there is a large diverse operation happening in nature right so it is so as i would say nature is designed to operate as a wireless networked living system so it's completely so what are the principles you an that continue to impress you here uh, from whatever we know to what we don't know i want you to take us there so um the first principle which would be perhaps quite pertinent to our context here is the sense of self you know it's been uh, spiritually often sp- spoken about now what is the self there is no self 
the self is everything the self is nothing you know we look at nature either from a scientific view or in the way adivasis our local communities have been viewing it their ontologies is often drawn deeply their philosophy their spirituality braids deeply with the geography and ecology of the place you know if you take the language of the lepcha people they live in sikkim yeah we don't have such folklore for us to uh, you know have a taste of that principle or, or perhaps we've been divorced from it in tamil also there's so much i'm sure a lot of us speak tamil here yeah um in the lepcha folklore the genesis story is that the the great mother made the first lepcha man and woman from the snow in the kanjanjunga mountains they live in sikkim so from sikkim you can see kanjanjunga true and when people die there is no heaven or hell the soul travels up the tista river and reaches kanjanjunga again so mm-hmm. birth death life everything is geographically vivid it is is rooted in place mm-hmm. and what is me what is the mountain what is the river the edges are blurry can we even think like that is is it possible for us to even perceive like that that such a radical shift of perception um for instance if you take our own uh, tamil um, language you take water bodies there are dozens of names for water bodies or just land you know ma you can use the word ma for mother mango as well as land valley you can use it for expanse outdoor land and there are hundreds of words for land as well the, these vividities this the way people speak has this principle of making myself so i am also the tree i am also the water i am also the land in 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 their folklore in their spirituality in their language and i think that's that's something we can, we can learn from you know if the self is not much more beyond what i think i am my idea of myself if it does not include what satish kumar would said uh, i put it down in another slide he said the three main words for our time is soul soil society you know the french renaissance also had three words you know often uh, different movements have three words to them and he said our three words should be soul soil society so this soul and whatever that for me it means soil which is the earth and the ecology from which i draw from to which i go back to and society which is my community which is human and more than human true yeah so interesting i mean when you um, uh, when when we say soul soil and society right so this connection of a, uh, getting a meaning to anything that we do right any activity that we do definitely requires more meaning and i think drawing from the meaning is where you can and i think soil is an interesting perspective because meaning without being without having the sense of groundedness which is what the soil or the earth gives that rootedness right and without that i don't think anything that we do will look like flotation uh, like a flow or a flotation right so we need that groundedness and i think interesting societies benefit when we have all these three combinations right it's interesting you and So tell me something. I mean, leadership has always um, learned uh, uh, learned from nature. We've always used metaphors. For instance, we use uh, the metamorphosis of a butterfly to to talk about transformation. We talk about the swarm theory of bees when we talk about teamwork and all that. So, what are some powerful metaphors that we are not using that nature can help us learn leadership better? that's a, that's an interesting question i had to think about that since this was also a ground which is is new for me to think about what leadership might mean and mm. uh, and what alternatives to the meaning of leadership can nature offer you know often leadership can take a a, a slightly ugly turn it could mean the withholding of power it could mean dominance one upmanship it could also imply competition if we were to walk away from that what would leadership mean um one simple example which comes to mind is leadership is a role and it's something which is not a person which i do, which i don't occupy and hold but it's a role and if you if you look at how birds migrate for instance you've seen pelicans if you've seen cormorants they fly in a v 
and uh, everybody would have heard about it. The V cuts is aerodynamically makes sense when you're flying long distances. And then the first bird takes all the drag, the air resistance, and that's you could call it the leader. And then every few hours, the last bird, which is taking the uh, least air resistance, keeps switching places. And so leadership is that that non-physical space, that role, that uh, and not the bird, not the individual. And I, I think there's, there's something there to uh, learn um, in in not being it an entity, but a space or a role. That's one thing. Um, I want to uh, take the metaphor of perhaps three different creatures. You know, oftentimes we, you know, in leadership and other kinds of uh, things, we use creatures, we use other beings as metaphors. And I just want to show you some of them and Good. what they might lend newly uh, to the definition of uh, leadership. Okay, so this is called a blue button. And uh, this is a very common sea creature. And if you walk the beaches of Chennai or all along the eastern coast of India, actually, uh, let's say there is a little cyclone or there's a bit of a storm or you know, high tide is too much. They get washed ashore and sometimes the tide may take it back or sometimes they're beached. But this is a very interesting creature. It's a very successful creature. It's quite common. It's, it looks like a jellyfish. It looks like a single creature. It's made up of polyps which work together. Some form the digestive system. Some form the stinging tentacles you know, which sting other crustaceans. And some form other parts, the circulatory system, other form, you know, uh, is not one organism. If you put them in water, if you stress them out, they can all become separate polyps. And when the conditions are right, they can come together and form this organism. It's a puzzle between singular and plural. And unlike our working systems, um, nobody tells them what to do. There is a sense of natural communion. Mm. And which cannot happen if each organism thought, the each polyp thought, I am this, I am myself first. That sense of communion, that sense of working together. Let me, uh, let me just uh, show you one more example. You know, we, we think of uh, human beings as uh, the most, um, what do you call it, sophisticated beings. And often... Uh, Krishnamurti offers a different, the philosopher Krishnamurti offers a different uh, take on that. He said, consciousness is its contents. So, or Malcolm Gladwell, he says, for a worm in horseradish, the world is horseradish. You know, so if I am inside my skull, this is what I can see. So I think, oh, this is the greatest thing there is to be. I am superior to everything. Scientifically speaking, the most complex and highest form of social organization exists in termites and ants. Now, ants are very interesting. They speak through chemicals. They put little dots of chemicals on the ground, telling others whether it's food, whether it's predator, whether it has to be taken back to the nest, should be thrown out. Their chemical speech is as complex, if not more, as our own vocabulary. And they do something called eusociality. Now, we are social, but they are eusocial. Um, so in the ant colony, there are... We, in describing ants, we describe them with hierarchy. You know, we say queen and we say soldiers and workers and you know, drones and other kinds of things. But there's no hierarchy there. Everybody is doing their work and everybody is contributing autonomously to the well-being of the entire community, entire nest. And what makes it the most complex form of social organization is that nobody is dictating to them. Nobody is telling them what to do. Scientifically, you know, people have dissected their nest, seeing if the queen is giving orders. Nobody. Everything is doing its job. It has a sense of community. So they call it you social because the sense of self clearly doesn't end with the specific ant. You know, oftentimes, you know, uh, in some experiments, it's been found that if you threaten a specific uh, single land, it doesn't get uh, very aggressive. You threaten the nest, everybody comes at you. Just one more, just one more. And uh, these are bees in a lotus vendor shop in Pondicherry. Um, it's the lotus uh, vendor later chased me away because I was you know, blocking our customers. So 
there's something interesting in bees uh, as well as other organisms they portray something called more than human democracy non human democracy mm. and we speak of democracy as if we uh, invented it we discovered it but it's been there for millions of years as a very important principle and we rarely talk about nature like this democracy is an important principle within living communities for their own survival and unity and and stability of interactions yeah. so bees uh, thomas seely did work on this within a beehive when bees go out seek for other places for a nest and come back the elder bees make sure they've listened to everybody's voice before getting together and making a decision so that's that's you know that rings of something you know or for instance you see it in other kinds of you see it in elephants you see it in bonobos they have a little panchayat system these primates where they actively resolve conflicts you know democracy as a need for meaningful existence survival is not there in our uh, definition of leadership and and society and uh, workspaces i think uh, or at least is less often spoken about true yeah. i mean what 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 are the other conflict i mean one is it's uh, interesting to learn about this conflict management from the um, non human democratic practices it takes a while for us to even understand because we just know democracy so what is this non human democratic practices right so anything a little further for us to understand on that uh, yuan oh. yeah so what democracy means um in in a certain sense or how we have defined it is that it has certain adjectives it goes by one is about equality now everybody acquires a, it's more about horizontal spaces in our in our speech in our systems there are too many vertical metaphors ladder sky is the limit and so on the, a vertical metaphor is by definition hierarchical there is somebody at the top there is somebody at the bottom it is very uh, reflective of the way our society functions it is about marginalizing it is about living off the poor it's about becoming richer than somebody else vertical metaphors also imply competition so these principles from uh, nature if you look at how bees function if you look at how elephants function elephants have these interesting ways of taking everybody's consent when when moving from place to place elephants also can be very sentient they are one of the few species where when an elephant dies other elephants gather around and they mourn they have a a, a funeral ritual before moving on you know they have that quality of sentience so uh, one uh, thing which non human democracy offers is horizontal metaphors uh, people are on the same plane and the space they occupy although diverse the, the things they have to speak may be entirely different but they are all on the same plane i think that would be a powerful um, meaning to draw from okay interesting i mean this is this concept of vertical metaphors and horizontal metaphors i think there is something for us to think a little deeper so i just don't want to rush to it i i mean i personally need to reflect on it because we don't know how we are functioning right so our as human beings we start aspiring yes mr krishan you want to ask something yeah i i want to hear some a little more about the what it means by horizontal metaphor vertical metaphor of course as you said we are all too familiar with especially in the corporate world but i am not very uh, clear about the horizontal metaphor that you are trying to explain could you elaborate please yes thanks thanks kishan yes so i could can i take that question yes yes please so you okay. um you know, in in human systems i think there are a lot of um, institutions which are now adopting this and i just want to bring it back to drawing from a ecological principle now it might be a bit abstract but i can then go ahead and say how we have applied it in education how we apply it in workspaces and that's something you may have heard of and it uh, let me just share my screen again and 
these are starfish and they are finding application in uh, leadership and business very interestingly and i think it's a great example for a horizontal metaphor um for instance uh, a starfish does not have a central nervous system well, let's go i think this picture is good and this, these were all uh, washed up on the beach and then that's a little crab hole and there's this crab which is moving all the starfish close to its hole and taking them inside and when i appeared it kind of vanished so it looks like i arranged the starfishes no i didn't <laughs> so so starfish does not have a central nervous system but this is a metaphor let's not draw a literal meaning from it so if you were to cut off a starfish's arm you would have two starfishes they would grow into two starfishes the the biological functioning of a starfish is metaphorically horizontal for instance the biological functioning of a human being if you were to cut off if you were to take off my central nervous system which is in the brain i could not function but a starfish can and uh, what that might mean for instance in the you know we in nature we talk about biological indicators in the sense that if there is something let's say there is water pollution or in some place water is very good you can see some species and find out for instance if you look at the blue damsel flies within chennai now they are vanishing very fast if you find them they live only in the purest of water and if they are vanishing it's a red flag so like that you can look for indicators of horizontal systems one thing is what is the relationship between uh, teaching staff and non teaching staff in a in a school or in a workspace the people who serve you coffee the people who cook are they able to sit uh, with you on the same tables and eat is that's one thing or is there a very clear distinction is there no cross pollinatory interaction at all between these two kinds of people the so called white collar jobs the employees as well as the non teaching staff that's one thing another indicator of a horizontal system i would say is for instance how women are treated another would be is there a dignity of work for instance i might i might be uh, the director i might be a cook i might be a cleaner i might be a uh, something else is there is each kind of work given as much dignity as the other treated with the same kind of significance that would be a very good horizontal indicator um and so on and and i think these spaces i think horizontal metaphors are important for diversity because in verticality in linearity you, you flip into monoculture you want when there is verticality you i want to become the ceo i want to become the director i want to become the highest paid person and that breeds monoculture and that that has been part of the kind of uh, uh, destability uh, and and the violence and systems of work we are seeing today but if there is a kind of dignity of work regardless of what you do in systems i think that is a very important factor for diversity um and for people to be able to be who they are and value uh, and feel valuable yeah true so it seems like um, you and that uh, there are multiple networks that nature gives right and we have somehow mastered the one way there uh, where nature gives two ways or multiple ways we have mastered this one way of uh, enjoying things or taking things or connecting with things so kind of th- uh, g- uh, throw some light there yuan okay so you know in our you know in our language you know we live you know if we look at our history we were living on this land and then we went through a colonial phase and uh, the british did not belong to this land so their um, view their perspective on uh, what was local here was extractivist because i don't belong here i want to take from here and go back and and make uh, some other land rich or, or whatever and some of that has passed on to us we still live in an industrial utopia and there is this very uh, uh, i think unnatural artificial distinction between the give and the take so i take something and i give something in nature or in ecological systems there is no give and take there is reciprocity 
the distinction between the two verbs don't in actuality exist we have separated it for our uh, way of meaning making um you know for instance if i if we look at the english language and if we look at languages like tamil assamese uh, other tribal languages mundari you know there's something called a noun verb language which means i have in in english there are more nouns than verbs i have more separate names for things for their separate beings than the connectivities between them as opposed to these languages our local languages they are verb noun there is more in my speech with which i can speak of its connectivities more than its separation and i think that uh, that says a lot um in terms of uh this concept of reciprocity how the very giving and the taking uh need not be two different things but it it is a um it is part of a relationship um we share and a oneness no not a connectedness but a oneness mm. 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 interesting so good i mean uh, there is a lot that that we seem to think we learn from nature or lots of things that we know but there is a gap in the human way of doing so there is a lot of things that we know but we don't do as much and that is where it leads me to think about sustainability when so sustainability is what when we say is an interplay of people profits and then comes planet but how can we reverse the order or how can we completely ensure that the sequence becomes planet people and then profits so we seem to know some things but there is still a gap but what is up? so what how how is how is this uh, entire sustainability um, ecosystem coming up what should we know about it interesting question and um, a few thoughts come to mind uh, the first one is that uh, if i may connect it to our previous question if you look at the people the the colonial era picked to marginalize you know during the british time we had something called the uh, criminal tribes act you know or other kinds of people who did we seek to marginalize you know are those people who did not who you, you know if you look at the the ecology of self reliance of adivasi people is very simple three words you know like soul soil society there is a jal jungle zameen you know water land forest these three we have we need nothing else i have water i can grow my crops i have shelter i have i can build my this uh, you know house i can i am completely self sustained and if there are self sustaining communities i cannot feed the industrial system because that is not on the principles of uh, self sustainability and that's something uh, interesting to note because these people did not get marginalized because they were in the first hand poor or they not know anything you know they know much more than us i think i'm sophisticated you know i i run a farm school so i know farming but i can't stitch my clothes i i can't build a house these people could do everything and they were systematically marginalized because you had to break the self sustaining the sustainability systems for you to become dependent on me and feed the industrial uh what do you call um, hegemony as it were that's my first thought my second thought would be um uh related to what you speak about practice uh you know i think a practice um we speak a lot about sustainability practice and i think that's at a very facile level you know take a cloth bag or you know don't use a straw uh you know buy khadi or what not can we speak of sustainability at a value level you know because if my core value is competition is if my core value is making profits if my core value is buying 10 cars 
there is no uh, you know room for sustainability let's let's not even go there um so what can be my values which is uh, egalitarian which is humanitarian and ecologically uh, you know sensible now i'd like to share a little value wheel i use and my colleagues use in our school uh to make our lesson plans it's the value wheel we ground our lesson plans in. and it is not for we run something called the farm school where children learn about ecology nature learn about laws rights how to partake in society and all that so i just want to share one second so we uh, so our farm school is called song lines and we call this the song lines wheel this is a set of values and uh, what it is not it is not that uh, um, part of the value wheel is not that children should have better marks part of the value wheel is not that children should get high paying jobs the value wheel has three uh, sections to it one is the earth it is earth centric so in that you have i speak about local environment now what that means is that in our textbooks we don't speak about local environment if i am living let's say in mumbai i learn about ganga and yamuna i do not learn about the powai lake i do not learn about the ra forest which i am directly connected to which is part of my locality and so on and various spokes of the wheel and the second spoke of the wheel is child centric which means the child has the space to direct and um, the learning as well as the planning as well as the the lesson plans we create must include a diversity of learning styles and abilities and similarly it's community centric and i this is uh, perhaps uh, uh, i think a good model uh, or or even a shape to emulate something for a workspace which i have not thought about i, I don't know what a value wheel might look like in a in a context of um, an office you know what would be our values our core values how would we choose them i think that would determine our practice our actions and tell us whether that is sustainable or not so i think we we should move our discourse from sustainability practice to what is my core value i live by and and function and hold this community i am responsible for a part of together true i mean but when you talk about the uh, uh, sustainability there is always a, a battle because i believe that i'm giving back to the society every day uh but the reality around me suggests something different because i believe i don't have a car here in singapore i don't uh, i don't as you said use plastic so there are lots of things i create bioenzymes at home to uh, to to ensure that i use products that are safe for uh, for for uh, from a biodegradable and uh, non toxic perspectives but still there's so much around me that's happening so as as in a, from a self leadership perspective i think i'm disciplined in giving back but the reality with all this pandemic around and all that and you see, you just flip the tv on you hear about the bushfires happening now in california i mean sometime back in australia so what's really um what what's really the uh, the ways in which we as individuals from a self leadership perspective give back so i believe it should be like a 2x principle where um, you take you give double than what you take but still there is that sense of uh, i i mean i don't know what uh, what's going to happen by me alone doing it or a few people doing it so what's what's really how should we look at it for instance even solar uh, we all tend to install a lot of things that we believe will so but really there's a lot of unknowns in this known i think that's a, that's a complex uh, uh, question and um, it has it's a bit unnavigable but i'll 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 speak what uh, what, what i think about it about giving back and what what all that might mean one part of giving back is of course my little consumer practices you know of of buying this or uh, choosing not to buy this what i use and what i wear and how i speak and so on that's one small part of it and uh, it's micro consumerist um it allows me to live by principles 
but there's only so much i could i can do for instance if i cannot help it i will have to consume some amount of uh, plastic as as a you know ordinary person it's kind of uh, you know becomes a, a need in the sense in the way uh, the system works so i think a very important part of giving back and because i'm part of a larger system whose uh, gushing current is contrary to this and and we are finding parallel adjacent or counter streams to this in trying to change the narrative i think a very important part of giving back is to give voice to those or that which does not have a voice is to stand up and speak up for people who cannot speak for themselves for for, for systems for living beings which cannot speak for themselves because we are privileged we have political power you know if you look at you look at any kind of development you know um we call it discriminatory development and i think that's a word we are trying to introduce in our common lingo if let me take an example where i uh, live in in chennai in north chennai the uh, backward uh, classes live in the fishing communities live in and then you come to south chennai the middle class and the mlas and the mps live in you look at so called development the thermal polluting power stations the adani port which is uh you know proposed recently where has it been proposed is it where the rich live the same ecosystem you can build it in the same marina beach you can build it in uh, elliots beach you build it there the mlas will give you help because they have privilege and power so you choose the fishing communities you choose the scheduled tribes area so they don't have political power they can't speak for themselves and i think as people with the kind of um, at least some amount of political power and privilege an important part of giving back is not just consumer choices but to use our voices to stand up for these things and uh, and therefore the quote you mentioned you know activism is my rent for living on this planet true true i think uh, it goes just a little bit more uh, it needs to be a movement and it can and it's not just some individual disconnected practices that each one starts believing in right so interesting and i think there is a question from uh, from from uh, krishnan i think krishnan uh, raman so i think he says uh, uh, he's he's obviously acknowledging the good knowledge you're sharing uh, you and he's saying uh, dominance hierarchies are natural in social mammals such as baboons as we talk about aligning with nature what is your suggestion to overcome the genetic programming of mammals like humans to subdue the natural urge of dominance okay so may i just share my screen again i want to show something which i often show and it's in a different presentation sure i think it might um help me uh, elucidate this point Let me go to something children did, and uh, I use this also often. So if there are people who are watching this and who've been in previous talks, so this is what we talk about. Mr. Krishna is talking about this. the natural urge for dominance um what i would point out to is our perception what have we chosen to see you know uh, often uh, science is funded by industries which are extractive it's funded by oil it's funded by coal and it kind of stains its philosophy something like the wood wide web which you mentioned so it simmers work of seeing this extraordinary underground subterranean oneness between fungi and trees and roots and mycorrhizae true could not have come 200 years ago because that was not where our perception was headed so this is what we see we see dominance this is the food chain and we tell children this things eat each other they are competing for survival it's a dog eat dog world we do something called the relationship web yeah 
we look at six different kinds of relationships and this is in the bendy crop and if you don't understand it at the beginning I, I let, maybe you can just listen to me it this includes predation as well but it includes competition commensalism mutualism which is friendship herbivory parasitism other kinds of relation this is what nature looks like closer to reality and there are more relationships and if you look at this it's non linear you can turn it any way you want i mean barring the fact that you know english language can be read in only one way you can follow any string you want so if we see dominance has its place in the larger complex scheme of interactions and and mesh work within ecology and seen in that place it makes sense it makes meaning but d- divorced from that larger picture to use the metaphor of dominance alone on and from nature uh is not a holistic picture or i choose to see it because that is where i am seeing from you know what uh, francis of azizi uh, said what you're looking for already exists where you're looking from that would be the case so i i hope that i answered the question in some sense krishnan i mean you're on mute krishnan is there so you one uh, first of all thank you i'm really enjoying the wisdom that you are spreading and um, so i i my philosophy very much aligns with you and i definitely believe that uh, all of all of these things exist in us the dominance as well as the maturity to coexist so it all boils down to the choices that we want to take in life and uh, i think very well answered that it's not that uh, this is dominance is not part of nature because when i look at principles in the universe anything we can observe is part of nature and question is which one do we choose so i got your i got the answer i just want to know are you thinking the same way thank you so much for answering that and uh, priya thank you so much for organizing this thoroughly enjoying this thank you thank you so good i mean uh, i i mean this this is given us a lot of different uh, i would say thoughts food for thought you and i think uh, it's not something that we um, that 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 leadership can just say yes this is the only aspect to look at from nature but there are multiple things so there is a huge uh, ecosystem that's thriving and we need to start from what i'm hearing from you just we need to start opening and looking beyond the obvious so there is a lot of things that we think that we see but which we are actually not seeing and we need to start observing some of these things and i think some of the pictures that you just showed with uh, showed to us right simple pictures from the environment around are we really observing i think when i see an insect on my plant i just take a bug spray and i just put it off i don't even know whether it is there is a commensalism element there or there is a element of uh, you know predation happening or this i don't even think of all these words and i think these are terminologies that we are unconsciously taking back to the workspaces that we are in to the environments that we are supposedly nurturing so nature has the other word right nurture along with it so but we are just not nurturing many things we tend to start looking at things from a unidimensional lens that if is if it if it is this we'll have to go against it so that's the way we are tuned as human uh, beings right the 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 or or that's the way we are taught to think but i guess from what you are saying is nature is operating in its own dynamics and we need to start looking beyond the obvious and it's important and it's a responsibility that i can see as a from a self leadership as well as from working with others right working with other leaders i think that this is a this is a connection that we need to uh, start start developing and leveraging is there anything we have missed speaking you and any more food, food for thoughts for us you want to leave us with just one more thing uh, i would add to what you had just uh, said was uh to the whole uh, domain of leadership and everything is um one is to look beyond the obvious but to also look at how we are looking hmm. and ask questions of oneself we call it we call it contemplation we call it metacognition are we aware 
of how we are seeing. We are aware of the object which falls in our perception. Can we be aware of the canvas on which it falls and how it operates? And when we see that, things clarify. We spot social constructs. We spot conditionings. Oh, something I experienced some time ago is affecting the way I'm seeing things. Or the thought uh, I picked up from here is affecting. Can we engage at that level also? I think that way we become far more sentient living beings when we look at the way we look. I think that's a very important uh, uh, aspect to all of this. Um, and, and to be uh, a, a questioning and alive human being, I think metacognition is important. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it is also, um, it would be irresponsible to say I'm looking at everything when we don't have that sense of connection to the larger consciousness that's operating, not just within us, but outside us. So it's the connection that we are able to the inner meaning with the larger outside purpose, right? If that connection is not built, then whatever lens we put in, we'll only get so much output. <laughs> yeah. So good. Anything else from our audiences? Any any further questions that you anybody may have? Uh, yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go please ahead. go ahead. Please go ahead. Yes, Vaishali. Yes. Uh, I don't have a question, but uh, I definitely uh, think that this conversation has, uh, you know, put a seed in my mind. Like uh, in our regular concrete world that we live in. We take everything so much for granted. And right now when you showed the bindi wasp, I was thinking that tomorrow when I see a bindi while cooking, it's going to make me think, oh, where does it come from? Otherwise, everything is so easily available to us that we take everything for granted. And we think it is our right to get everything, uh, you know, and uh, we just pay money and get it. But so much... Uh, ecological resources and so much, uh, uh, you know, so many forces and laws of the nature go into bringing that small thing to me is something that uh, your presentation uh, invoked in my mind today. Thanks so much for this. And I have two small babies who are like 10 months old, but I would surely uh, want them to look at whatever they are getting in that manner than what I have learned to see. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that's what we started off, right? When you look at the paper, are we looking at the clouds, right? So I think uh, we haven't learned to see uh, all the things that it involves to get the paper. We just, we perhaps may say, yes, it comes from trees, but that's the limited connection that we draw to. I mean, what really happens to the larger extent, right? So, yes, good. Thanks, Vaishali. And yes, Christian, sir. Yeah, just... Uh... <clears throat> Uh, going back to the wonderful question which Krishna Raman had put in about the, uh, the dominance uh, being the natural urge. I think one of the related aspects to my mind which comes is that dominance towards what end or dominance towards what objective. So if you look at it in the organization's context or the corporate world context, uh, if... Uh, uh, if, a, if, a, if a leader, uh, if a corporate leader looks at dominance for profitability or dominance for the well-being of planet, uh, the actions would be different because the end objective is then different. So I think somewhere, while dominance is an urge which I truly concede, but where we where we need to think is. Uh, what is the uh, what dominance are we talking about, or what dominance are we seeking about? Hmm. Is it perhaps aggressive dominance and assertive dominance? Uh, I don't know. What or anything I, you have, you want? What I would add to it is, um, you know, in our conversations, um, especially in the workspace and the business world, we speak a lot about the ends. Um, we don't speak about the means as a process, the way something is done does not matter. I think it matters because it, it creates the culture of soil or the soil of culture. How some we go about, doing, if it's dominance, to what ends, I think through what means also is very important because all these interrelationships 
and and complexities exist in the in the means space as it were in the in the how in the process space I th- if we can be alive uh, to that as well that's the only thing i would add i think i think ends and means need to be given equal thought and footing uh you know if i may just uh, add one more thing uh, and it's a it's a different way of saying what tignat han said about the paper on the clouds it's a native american saying um and that was the political practice hundreds of years ago because before the spanish inquisition and uh, and the violence they faced in uh, the america we know now they said in every deliberation we have to think about how it will affect the seventh generation from now it's called the seventh generation principle that was their politics that was their communal culture are we even capable of having a political vision like that i do something i i build something how will it affect the seventh generation from now i mean it sounds almost like fiction but that was their uh, policy and that's something they worked by um and that speaks about the means if it was just the ends uh we won't hear such uh, uh statements yeah okay yeah quite true it is not only the results which is important but it is the results through the right process which is important true yes kumar yeah i, I have a question just now you spoke about uh, one thing where uh, if you do something we need to think of what would happen after the seventh generation don't you think that will be the detrimental factor for the growth aspect you want if we uh, if we keep uh, start thinking about uh, the future okay then uh, uh, won't it be a compromise or won't it be a detrimental factor for the current uh, um, prospecting or current uh, uh, growth aspect uh, even or how do, how do we balance this how i would look at it is our perception and uh, definition of growth for instance our present paradigm of growth does not have enough for us does not have enough for the next generation and we see the youth movements right now against the draft eia against the clearances they are saying get out of power enough you uh, have not left uh, you've left rubbish for us for us to live but you know what what the native american principle perhaps says and i don't want to push my point too much uh, with with what i might believe in is that the native american sense of self spanned over time i am me i am my children i am my grandchildren of if my the sense of self was that what would my definition of growth be how would i use the resources i have what would be my relationship with the earth i, I think that's a question we could dwell upon when well, i think it's very it, mm. it's driven by what each individual defines that self right so if we believe that um, uh in, in a simple thing if you take care of something so well you believe that the generations ahead would would be able to nourish it and it's also about uh, the minimalism that we start looking at vis-a-vis the value that you give to uh, some of the uh, things that we own in life right so it is it is not just about saying i i have nothing in hand but i own things that can be of value that the generations can take forward in a similar way right i think it's about connecting to um uh, what we what 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 you think is sustainable growth that can lead to the future or if you believe that this is what it is from your lens perhaps kumar then we you will define it in the way that you are um, that that you believe should be the end result right so if you believe that it it has to go then you will start channeling your uh, your your works in a way that will align to that larger i think that's what yuan is saying it's about the larger output that you believe in that will help you to define the uh, the path what what i'm really saying is i'm not i'm not giving a definition but um, i think these are some things we can question and and uh, look at perhaps one or two more times so what what is growth what is what do i mean by self what all does it really encompass what is a good life you know what is a livelihood uh and what gives meaning really you know these are things we could look if we have a deep way of looking at i think we would go ahead with things of 
about growth and progress and development to far more or non violent way non violent to each between us as well as to the earth um, um, yeah yeah that's what i want that a point buena yeah uh, if there's time can i ask one small question please yeah yeah please you one uh, the session has been very interesting and uh, this has come out so very well i'm so happy that you could uh, join us today uh, my question to you is something very uh, small nothing as macro as all these people have spoken about uh, in my little world i have a dog a rescue puppy uh she is very dear to us and we love her uh, unconditionally she is the love of our lives um so now that i hear your speech i am like wondering are we doing the right thing by keeping her in doors putting her on a leash and saying you don't go there you don't go here you've got to eat only this because she loves to go step out in the evenings and sniff around and eat some rubbish and puke it out in the night that's that's something that she does all the time but uh, uh, i when i show so much of love and care for her sometimes i do wonder if are we doing the right thing by keeping pets at home and saying that we love them now that i hear your speech i think uh, uh, this has been going on in my mind and i had to ask you this i think it's a lovely story what you said and uh... i am in no position to answer that question I, i think you know you know your pet and you know your context i i don't know uh uh your context um no but generally is this the right thing to keep animal as pets indoors i don't want to give a generic answers because uh, generic answers are problems and a lot of the problems of generic answers we are facing and one of the biggest problems of generic answers is our education system somebody in delhi decides what everybody should study whether i am a narikorava tribe whether i am a, a fisherman you know as a, as a fishing community if you if you've spoken to fishermen children they have a innate sense of which side the long shore current is going which part of the tidal cycle is happening they can plainly predict weather you know better than the uh, meteorological departments very clearly i've been i've been walking the chennai coast for over two decades i cannot do that so the diversity of contexts so you disregard all those kinds of knowledge systems contexts cognitions you give a generic answer to all of that you study this okay. regardless of abilities children have all kinds of abilities you know there's a story is the late ken robinson he just passed away recently an extraordinary educationist in the element he speaks about uh, a, a ballet dancer which perhaps some of you would know and she would she would keep fidgeting on a so she would break pencils and she would you know break the uh, you know the legs of her chairs and so on and people thought uh, her parents thought she had problems they took her to a psychiatrist the psychiatrist was a very good man after speaking to her for a uh, few minutes he turns on music and then he takes the parents shuts the door and he goes outside and he shows the parents through the window so look at her she is dancing beautifully so your child is a dancer put her in a dancing school the school is wrong not your child you know so and she was jillian lin by the way she is a very famous ballet dancer this is the real story of jillian lin i think that's that elucidates the problem of generic answers if i may say even as a way of wriggling out of your question but uh, I, yeah i'm sure that <laughs> thank you yes yes you had something krishnan so i'm just going to attempt uh, giving another perspective to bhavana so it's not really an answer or a solution uh, so bhavana you know that there are many street dogs who really suffer so on, from one point of view they are actually getting the freedom they are not caged in a home but there are many people who bring them home and give them a very good life the other way to look at it is that lot of times people when they have a pet dog and even if you leave them hundreds of kilometers away giving them freedom the dog actually likes to come back home they don't want that because they feel you know more freedom at home so you will see that both perspectives uh, 
our realities. And I'll just leave you with that thought. True. Great idea. Thank you so much. Yes. So good. And I think, um, so this has been a good set of discussion. And I think it's uh, things that, that some things are common sense, but common sense, as we always say, is the most difficult um, thing to find. Uh -huh. it. <laughs> so I guess this is basically helping us to raise our awareness, I think, on, on, on how we look at the ecology. And ecology doesn't mean just one part of it, right? There are multiple constituents to this ecology and one needs to understand what ecology actually mean it could be organisms it can be communities it can be the environment it can be a lot of components put together that make up ecology and we need to start observing things there and connecting it that is uh, sometimes there is a joy when we look at everyday things and connect it back right it's just like that so it's uh, the joy of connecting back from the ecology to the self leadership practices that we invoke in ourselves and then take it back to the people that we serve the organizations that we lead and also to the larger society and world and in, in, in that context. So I think this has been a good spend of all our times, UN. And I think um, I should only say thank you for taking the time and spending it with the audience. We are not your usual audience, as you said earlier, but uh, we, we, we would be a convert soon, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is a very fresh part. I've never walked on uh, or even thought about this. Uh, um, this was a new line of thinking for me and uh, I, I've, I've learned uh, as well, uh, thinking about this and as well as some of these interactions. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you, everybody. And I would say good night to each one of you. It's almost closer to uh, mid, uh, 11 o'clock in the night here in Singapore. And I would say it should be a good uh, one, one and one, more than an hour in this discussion, I would say, in India. So I would say go back to your dinners or uh, suppers and let's all take uh, have the rest of the weekend uh, with, with these thoughts in mind. Thanks, Yuan. Thanks, 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 Priya. Thank you. Thank you, Yuan. Thanks, Thank you, Yuan and Priya. Thank you.